Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Din and Daf. I'm Alana Steinhain, and we are going to conceptualize a halakhic principle this week from the Daf, as we do every week. Sorry for last week's hiatus. It is great to be back with you. And I had the good fortune of meeting two Dafyomi learners from Hadron, who I've been learning with unbeknownst to me for these past several months. So if I'm ever in a place where we see each other, please, please, please come up and say hi, because learning is about creating community. It is not just about content. It is also about the community of learners. So it was really a joy uh, to meet those two people. And I look forward to meet, meeting more. So we're going to talk about a principle that's come up a few times in these last couple of weeks in the DAF, and that is Zachin Ladim Shalobafanov. That essentially I can perform a transaction on someone else's behalf for them without their knowledge. If that transaction is a gain for them. Now, implicitly and then explicitly elsewhere, or not elsewhere, but explicitly, that means if it's not something that is a gain for them, I can't do that without them knowing, without their knowledge. But I want to focus on this concept because I think it raises two really significant questions. One is the relationship between people meaning how are we all connected? If I'm able to do something on your behalf and it sticks, even now your knowledge, what does that say about the connectivity of people? And the second is, how much do we actually care what you think or care what you want? It seems like we're assuming what you want. Um, do we care what you want? Or do we just say, if we define it as a salute, if we define it as a positive, then the transaction works, right? So those are the two questions that I want to ask today. I mean, of course, they're they're all in a legal frame, right? Like legally, how connected are we? And legally, to what extent do we care, you know, subjectively how you feel versus some sort of objective measure of how you know if something is a net gain or not. So in order to start this conversation, we're going to look at a Mishnah in Gittin. The Mishnah in Gittin, Parak Aleph, Mishnah Vav, is talking about if somebody decides that they're going to give a get, meaning a get, a writ of divorce, or a situation of what we call a get shechurur, a writ of freedom or a, a writ of emancipation to an evid kanani. But instead of giving it directly to the person, they give it to somebody else and essentially say, take this on behalf of the woman whom I'm divorcing. Or meaning like once I give it to you, you are zoche on it, you are attaining it on her behalf, or take this writ of emancipation on behalf of the Ebed Kanani that I am emancipating, right? So that's what happens here, okay? The Mishnah is going to make it sound like he's just saying, here, give this to my wife or give this to my Eved. But the Gemara explains that the way we understand this is they're actually saying, like, take it on their behalf, okay? So Haomer, when somebody says, Tain get zelishti, give this get, really accept this get on behalf of my wife. Ushtar shechur zela avdi, or accept this writ of emancipation on behalf of my Evid. So what is the status of that transaction? Right? I didn't give it to my wife and I didn't give it to my Evid. I gave it to somebody else to accept it on their behalf. So there is a machloket. The mission starts with the opinion of Rabbi Meir. Im lachzor bishnehen, yachzor Rabbi Meir. So Rabbi Meir says, I actually think that that um, transaction of either the divorce or the emancipation has not yet gone through. If the husband or the master decides that they want to go back, renege, they can, right? Just because they had somebody else perform the transaction of accepting it on behalf of the Isha or on behalf of the Eved doesn't make it binding and effectuated. That's Rabbi Meir's view. The Chachamim the say, no, there's a difference. The two cases are different. Begite Nashim, in a case of a writ of divorce for a woman, that's when if the husband wants to renege, he still can. 
even though it seemed that somebody was trying to perform the acceptance of it on her behalf. But he cannot renege, the master cannot renege in a case of giving a writ of emancipation to someone else on behalf of their evid. Why? What's the difference between these two cases? Because while you are allowed to do something in, that's in someone's interest on their behalf, you are not allowed to do something that is not in their interest on their behalf if they did not appoint you. And what is essentially being said, that in the case of a get, the assumption is that it is not good for the woman to be divorced, right? And therefore, when the husband says, accept this on behalf of my wife, the transaction is not effectuated. But when it comes to freeing a slave, freeing a slave is a net positive for that slave. And therefore, when the, when the master says, here, take this on behalf of my slave, it works, even though it's totally unbeknownst to the slave. So the Mishnah continues to explain why is it that in the case of a get, we, assent, we assume that the divorce is a chova for her, it's a negative for her. But in the case of shichur avadim, we assume that it is a negative zuchut for him. Why? Because she'im yirtzeh shelo lazunet avdo rashai. Because if an owner of an Evid Knani decided that they didn't want to give rations to their Evid, in theory, they could do that. Which means that the fact is that just because the Evid is no longer going to be provided with rations, now that they're free, it's possible that they wouldn't have had rations even when they were an Evid. So essentially, the argument here is, it is a net gain for them to have their freedom, and the loss of losing rations every day is not a real loss, because in theory, they could have lost their rations as an evid too. But what about a woman? The man can't unilaterally decide not to give his wife the food she needs to survive. And if that's the case, then the net loss when she gets divorced is that nobody is providing her with food. So when we look at somebody who says to a third party, accept this get on behalf of my wife, we say, that's a case of chavin la'adam shalobifanav, or shalobifanah, right? That's a case of doing something negative to the woman because you're now depriving her of her food. But when it comes to take this writ of emancipation on behalf of my Eved, what we're doing there is only a zuchut for the Eved because they could be deprived of food even as an Eved, right? So that's interesting. That's the distinction. So Rabbi Meir fires back. Amar Lahan, Rabbi Meir says, wait a second. Why do you think it's a net gain for the Eved to go free? Vaharehu posel et domina truma. Actually, there is a negative. There is a loss for this Evid. The Evid, if they are an Evid of a Kohen, is no longer going to be allowed to eat from Truma. That is a loss. It's something they could only do when they were an Evid. And now they won't be able to do it. The same way if a woman who was married to a Kohen divorced and wasn't going back to her own Kohen family, she wouldn't be allowed to eat the Kohen's food anymore, right? She wouldn't be allowed to eat Shurma, right? So I actually think, says Rabbi Mayer, I think they're both net negatives, right? I want you to notice that the whole conversation here revolves around the question of finances, right? Is it a financial benefit or is it a financial loss for somebody to get divorced or for somebody to get emancipated? Right? The Chachamim then fire back. Amrulo, they say, well, Mipneshehu Kinya, no. Well, this whole thing is actually only because the Eved only gets the Churma in the first place because the Eved is considered uh, the acquisition 
of a uh, of the, of their master. Now, what exactly is being said here? Is it there are other aspects of you know being an eved that could be taken away because that person is just a kinyan? What's it, what exactly is being said here is not necessarily clear, but suffice to say, the chachamim think that there is something that is net positive about getting out of avdut, and there is something that is net negative of getting out of a divorce. Now, let's keep in mind, we're obviously not talking about an aguna case. What becomes, I think, very difficult is, let's say you're in an aguna situation, God forbid, right? Here, we're assuming it's a healthy marriage or healthy-ish. She doesn't want to be divorced. She wants to be supported, right? So just to give a divorce to somebody on her behalf, that's no good. It doesn't work, right? So what we see from here is we're looking at this aspect of zachin versus chavin. Is it a merit or is it a negative? And that seems to be defined more by finances by anything than by anything else, right? Now, the question is, where does this concept even come from, right? And of course, the Gemara is going to take up the question of where the concept comes from, because the concept itself seems to come from something that itself is pretty financial, but also has significance. Like, um, I would say, like, in a religious sense or in a status sense or in an identity sense, right? Like, it's interesting, you know, Avdut and Lahavdil, Ishut, and the example we're about to see of um, acquiring land, acquiring, acquiring a plot of land in Israel, these are all, like, pretty identity-shaping transactions. This isn't like selling a shovel on a Tuesday, right? Like, it's so funny you know, you're not supposed to give gifts on Shabbos unless somebody's going to be able to use it on Shabbos. But one thing you can do is you can have someone or you can acquire it on behalf of the other person because Zacham Adam Shalobafanov before Shabbos and it's considered theirs. And then you give it to them on Shabbos, but it's been theirs all along. That's like the most prosaic, mundane example, right? These examples are like you're divorcing somebody without their knowledge, right? Um, and that's, you know, much earlier in our halachic history, but it is interesting that it's such an intense uh, issue and situation. So the place where the Gemarian Kiddushin, Daf Membedam and Aleph, says it comes from, is actually from the Shvatim, the tribes being promised land in Eretz Yisrael. So let's take a look at first the Pasuk that the Gemara is going to use, and then what the Gemara itself does, because it's going to start bringing us into the logic behind Zachin Adam Shalobafanov. So the Pasuk is, V'nasi echad, nasi echad, mi mateh, So you're going to take one nasi, one prince from each tribe, and that's who's going to acquire the land on behalf of presumably like a whole tribe, right? So there you got one person who's acquiring the land. I also want to point out, it's certainly not going to be in front of all the people for whom they're acquiring it. Some of those people aren't even born yet, but certainly it's not going to be in front of all the people who are um, acquiring it and giving them permission or asking them to do that on their behalf, right? It's a ritualized form of apportioning this land. So the Gemara in Kiddushin really struggles with this Pasuk and tries to figure out what we can learn from it and has like three attempts. And one of those attempts is Zachin Adam Shalobafanov. So here we go. And the context is, you know, the, the Gemara is talking about um, having a Shaliyah to uh, perform Kiddushin, to be Mekadesh and Isha, right? So Shlichut, being an emissary, is the context of this, which is also where somebody does something on someone else's behalf. So here we go. 
Belahad Amar Rav Gidel Amarav. That which Rav Gidel Amarav says, and we're coming in in medias race, we're coming in in the middle of something, but we're just going to pick it up where it is. How do we know that a person's emissary is like the person themselves, right? So I send somebody to do something, it's Ki'ilu, I did it. It has the same binding status. It works. Shana Amar, as it says, V'nasiachad, nasiachad mimateh, because we have this pasuk in a Midbar Lamedalid that says one Nasi from each tribe is going to do something on behalf of all the people, is going to get the land on behalf of all the people, right? So say, ah, mehacha. maybe we should learn shlichut from here. We don't learn shlichut from here. Well, there are a number of places that we learn shlichut from, but that's not our topic for today. But the idea is let's learn, let's learn the principle of being an emissary from here, of shlichut. So you're going to say, no, 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 no. Think about it. Do you really think that this is a case of shlichut? This is a case of being an emissary? Ketanim minors can't make, they can't appoint a shaliach. And obviously, the land is also being inherited by minors. So can't use that puzzle. Clearly, there's somebody working on behalf of a bunch of people. But we can't use that puzzle for shlichut because it seems to apply to people who can't make shlichim. So attempt number two. Ella, okay, let's try again. Ki ha de Rava Bar Rav Huna, like Rava Bar Rav Huna says. Da Amar Rav Bar Rav Huna, Bar Rav Huna, Amar Rav Gidel Amar Rav. So says Rava Bar Rav, Rava Bar Rav Huna. I don't know why I'm having so trouble with that. Says in the name of Rav Gidel, in the name of Rav. I mean, nine shazachna la'adam shalob afanav. How do we know that? You can do something that's in the interest of another person on their behalf without their knowledge. Shana Amar, as it says, v'nasi achad, nasi achad. These... Princes from each tribe are able to do something on behalf of their whole tribe, clearly without being appointed by their entire tribe, by every single person, and not even being known by every single person. Right? So that's Zachem Adam Shalom It's a real Zachut. They get a portion in the land of Israel. Wait, wait, wait. Is it logical to say that it's only a Zachut to get land in Israel? It's also negative. Some people would rather have a hill, a hilly area. They wouldn't want to have a valley area. And then other people would rather have a valley area and they would rather not have a hill area, right? It's like in our family, we have something called you get what you get and you don't get upset. But the fact is you have to say that because people get what they get and they do get upset, right? <laughs> so the question of, is it a zuchut? Is it full, complete, complete zuchut or not, right? And the Gemara drops it. And moves on to Elik the Rav Bar Rav Huna. No, it's this other Rav Bar Rav Huna statement. To Amar Rav Bar Rav Huna, Amar Rav Gidel, Amar Rav says Rav Bar Rav Huna in the name of Rav Gidel, the name of Rav. Minayin liyatomim shabo lachlok b'nichsei avihen shebeitim mamidim lahem apotropis lachuv v'liskol. From where do we know that orphans, sadly, that are they're young, right? They're minors that come to divide up their fathers. Uh, property that Beitin uh, gives them an optropus. Beitin gives them a, a, a representative, like a steward for their um, for their stuff until they grow up. Both lachuv, both for negative and also this quote, and also for positive. Right? How do we know? And the Gemara says, wait, wait, wait. What do you mean lachuv? Am I? What? What? Why would they do something negative to them? That's a bad idea. Ella lachuv al menat this quote, meaning. How do we know that we give people an apotropus? We give these yetomim ketanim, these minor, these orphans who are minors, we give them a steward to even be able to do something that in the short run is negative in order to get to a net positive. Talmud Lomar, as we, you know, as is said, right? Take one nasi from each shevet. Excuse me in order to get the land. So meaning, even if it's a land, you don't love that it's so hilly, ultimately you get land in Eretz Israel, right? So this is really interesting. It's clear that the Gemara is trying to figure out like what kind of representation is this? How does this work exactly? Does it have to be something that's only a zuchut, or can it even be something that has like a little bit of chova in it on the way to zuchut, right? So this is where we land. Now, even though 
the Gemara seem to kind of leave behind the idea that the Nasiachad Nasiachad is the source for Zachan Adam Shalom Bafanov, the concept and this whole conversation that revolves around the question of, well, are we talking about a case of Shlichut being an emissary? No, because there are minors involved. Are we talking about a case of Zachan Adam Shalom Bafanov? Maybe not, because it's not a full Zachut, right? Are we talking about an apotropis, a steward? for yitomim ketanim, for orphans who are underage, right? Yes, that's what we're talking about. It's interesting. These are three, it seems, different forms of what it means to do something on someone else's behalf, be able to effectuate transactions. And when the Rishonim and the Achronim try to figure out what exactly is the basis of Zachan Adam Shalom B'fanov, it's really interesting that even though the Gemara seemed to reject that you know, shlichut could not be done by a minor, right? And if we say that zachin could even be done for a minor, right? Then it's, it, you wouldn't think that zachin is because of shlichut. And yet, Rashi and Gittin, Tedem and Bet says, v'zachin lo adam shalom b'fano, we, you are allowed to perform a transaction that is in someone's interest, even on their behalf, even if they don't know about it. Why Because we all know, we're all witnesses. We all know that this person who's getting the benefit, they're very happy for this person to be their shalich, right? They're very happy for this other person to be their shalich. Almost like, even though they didn't make you their emissary, we all know that because it's a zuchot, they would have made you their emissary. And so like that's enough, right? So they basically suggest that even though the Gemara makes a distinction, it seems, between Shlichut and Zachla Adam Shalobafanov, that Rashi seems to think, and others along with him, that Zachan La Adam Shalobafanov is actually based on some concept of Shlichut. And it seems to me when I look at that concept of Shlichut, that Anan Sade, we are all witnesses that this person would have loved for you to be their Shaliach it's really kind of saying, you know, we still care about the agency of the person who's going to get it at the end of the day. We just think that that person would have made you their shaliach. And so that like shlichut and potential is good enough. So zachalat and shalobafanov, because they would have wanted you to be their shaliach, right? Now that's very different, I think, than another suggestion as to where zachalat and shalobafanov comes from, which you see in the Ketzodah Choshen. And in the Ketzodah Choshen, you see the following. Dat kama harishonim sheamru. Some of the rishonim think dezachia mitorat yad amru velo mitorat shlichut. That the ability to effectuate this um, transaction of being able to be like even zoche on something, to be able to even acquire something on someone else's behalf without their knowledge, if it's good for them. That's not about shlichut. That's not about being an emissary. It's like you're their yad, like they're your, you're their hand, right? Now that's really interesting. We saw this in the daf, a conversation about maybe someone's chatzer, right? Someone's property is like their hand. That feels very different to me to say that zachan adam shalom b'fanov is based on suggesting that the person who's zoche on it for them is like their hand. That to me doesn't say anything about the agency of the person who's ultimately going to get it. Whether they want to or not, like you don't tell your hand, oh, hand, you should stay here, right? Like I know that at some subconscious level, but if somebody sticks something in my hand, right? Or like tapes it to my hand, I, I may have no agency in that conversation. I may make no decision in that conversation, right? Similar to if somebody threw something in my chatzer somebody threw something in my property. It's not really focused on the agency of the person who's ultimately going to get it, the way that shlichut is focused on the agency of the person who's actually going to get it, right? So I think these are two very different things, right? And by the way, the Ketzot then adds, even those who do say, like we just said on, Ra uh, on Rashi's behalf, that this acquisition on someone else's behalf is actually based on shlichut. I want to clarify 
not the way Rashi says it. It's not because we have some sense of, well, the person would have wanted to make them a shaliach anyway. It's It's based on scriptural decree, right? So like there's two tracks in being a shaliach. One track in being a shaliach is we know that the person would have made you a shaliach or maybe they had to make you a shaliach. Another is we have a special scriptural decree that says you count as a shaliach for this person, right? Now, that also sounds to me a little bit like we don't care so much about their agency, right? Because it's like the Torah made them a shaliach. You didn't make them a shaliach. The Torah made them a shaliach. So either you're part of their body or the Torah made a decision for you, right? That's very different than Anan Sade. We all are witness to the fact that Michle, this person would have wanted that they would have wanted this person to be their shaliach, right? So the first question that we asked about the issue of Zachim Adam Shalobafanov is, or I keep leaving out the low, Zachim Lo Adam Shalobafanov, right? The first issue that we asked about is how much, or really the second issue that we asked about is how much do we really care about what you feel? Well, if it's a shlichut model on the on the logic of anan sade denichle denahavi hai shluchulachi, then we do care what you think. And we want to know what you think. And based on what you think, that's what's going to determine if that this works, right? But based on the idea that the zachnal adam shlobafanov is based on yad, or even maybe it's based on shlichut, but it's a shlichut that's exerat katuv, we care very little about what the person themselves thinks it seems, right? It's kind of interesting. And I would say it's almost like a seesaw, right? It's like, to the extent that we care so much about what the person on whose behalf you're doing this really feels and really cares about, it's like we're giving them independence from you, right? Like what they think's ma- think matters. But to the extent that we just consider you, consider you an extension of them, right? We're giving them less independence and we're also giving you deeper connectivity with them right? Like you are their yacht. That's very powerful from a legal perspective. You are an extension of them, right? So these are two uh, perspectives on the logic of where this comes from. Now, what I would say is we have another like um, heuristic or litmus test. That's the word I'm looking for. We have another litmus test in Zachem Mola Adam Shalobafanov, right? Like you could say that what we were just talking about is like the la adam part. Is it based on shlichut or is it based on yad? But now we also have to talk about zachin, right? Like what makes it a zachut? Who decides that it's a zachut? And let's take a look at two different approaches on who decides that it's a zachut. Not that they're necessarily mutually exclusive. They're kind of on a spectrum, on a continuum. But it's interesting to consider that again, when we ask, who decides whether it's a zchut or not? It's actually a similar question. Like, is this objectively defined as when something is objectively legally defined as a zchut, like, I don't know, an evid getting free, right? That didn't seem to be about how does the evid feel about getting free? It seemed to be about what financial benefits or deficits is that person accruing, right? Um, Or are we actually, do we care about their feelings, right? Do we care about their feelings? So let's take a look at the Rambam. um, Okay. If somebody is transferring ownership to their friend um, of a gift through a third party, once that third party has physically taken it, meaning, for example, they did an act of kinyan, right? They did an act of acquisition. So if it's metaltalin, if it's portables, they did mashicha on them, right? They moved it, like they dragged it. Oh, or if we're talking about property, if we're talking about non-movable property, the star right, the contract for it came to that person's hand, right? Oh, hechazik bakarka, or the person actually did something that shows 
a uh, a chazaka over the land, meaning that shows that they own the land, right? So maybe, you know, I don't want to say this offhand, what's considered a uh, chazaka in this way, but let's let something along the lines of, I don't know, like digging a hole in the ground or something, right? So once they do that Kenyan action, zachachaviro, they're that person on whose behalf they did it, right, is considered to have acquired that non-movable property or that movable property, as the case may be. Even though the gift has not yet reached their hands. And the key issue of the binding nature of this transaction is that the giver is not allowed to renege. The gift has been given. They are not allowed to renege. Aval, but by the way, hamekabel yadoala elyona, the person on whose behalf this was done, who's going to ultimately get this item, they still have a lot of leeway. Imratsa mekabel, if they want, they can choose to accept it from the third party who already got it on their behalf. And imlo ratsa eno mekabel, if they don't want it they don't have to take it, right? Now, this sounds very subjective. Right? Because we only do a zechut for somebody, not in front of them, but not something that's a demerit. It's a zechut to be given a gift if you want it. But if they don't want it, you don't give somebody a gift against their will, right? So here, the way the Rambam presents this, and notice he's not talking about status here, right? He's talking about acquisition of property. He's not talking about the examples that we were saying about an Evid or an Isha before, right? He's talking about property, and it's very subjective. If the person wants the property, then it's a zechut. And if the person doesn't, then it's not, right? Now, it's interesting to ask, okay, so what happens with the property if the original giver can't give it back, <laughs> right? So interesting question that comes up. So that's like at what end, one end of the spectrum. It's very subjective. We care so much what the person on whose behalf you're doing this thinks. And then I want to say, at the other end of the spectrum, we have an example like the Ramban on Kiddushin Kaf Gimel Amad Aleph, which is talking about um, you know, a situation of freeing a slave, which according to Chachamim is considered a zuchut in that Mishnah that we read at the beginning, right? Get an Aleph of. It's considered a zuchut. Why? Because objectively, this person is not losing anything, right? It's not like they're losing their access to food. They could have lost that when they were in Evid, right? You could also argue, and this discussions go back and forth, you know, uh, it, it's not like they're losing even uh, food of a Kohen because, and, and this is what some people think the end of that Mishnah meant, where it's, well, this person is only eating the churma because they're a Kenyan, because they're an acquisition of their master. Is some people say it means, you know, the master can decide. One second. I'm going to stop the share. I realize it's a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. The master can decide to sell him to a Yisrael. Sell the Evid to a Yisrael. And then they're not going to have churma either, Right. And maybe some people also talk about maybe there are gains because before the Evid can only marry a Shivcha Knanit. And now different options are open, right? So it's interesting. And then other people say he would rather be married. <laughs> it's a different conversation. But the point is, it seems to be that in that discussion of the Get Shichrur, the writ of emancipation for an Evid, we just weren't as subjective about it of you know, the way the Rambam just described, do you want the Matana or do you not want the Matana? We were kind of like, well, legally is this described as a Zuchot or legally is this described as a Chobah? And so the Ramban, when talking about that, and we'll go back to share screen, 
the Ramban, when talking about that, says on, um, you know, it, it, it's in the middle, but we'll just go with this. It says, Hu hadin da'afilu nami bal korcho. This would also be the case of being able to get a writ of emancipation for a, um, a slave to free them even against that slave's wishes. Meaning even if that slave says, no, I want to stay indentured. I want to stay indentured. We define it as a zechut anyway. And the Ramban adds, and this I think complicates sort of the purity of the question of, are we asking if the person themselves gets to determine whether something is a zechut or are we saying there's something legally defined as a zechut? Because he adds saying the reason why it works if it's against that, um, the Eved's, uh wishes is Mishum Tame de Rava for the reason delineated by Rava on that Amud, which is de Kesef Kabbalat Rabo Garmalo. That the fact is the money that the master receives is actually what effectuates the transaction, right? So ultimately, you know, the fact that somebody, you know, um uh ultimately the fact that somebody did this transaction on behalf of the Eved, if we're talking about Kesef, at least, if we're talking about money passing from somebody to the master in order to free the slave, then even if the slave wanted to stay indentured, the uh, zuchut would still accrue to the slave and he would still be freed because ultimately the transaction is effectuated by the master accepting the money rather than the transaction really being effectuated by whoever is acting on the Evid's behalf, giving the money, right? So it's a little bit complicated and it moves us out of just like the clean imagining that the master is giving someone a writ of emancipation on behalf of the Evid. That may not work against the Evid's wishes, even though it's a zuchut, because ultimately it's the acceptance of something on behalf of the Evid that is supposed to be at play here, that is supposed to make the transaction work. But at the very least in a situation of Kesef where somebody would give the master money on the Eved's behalf in order to emancipate the Eved, it might even work Bal Kor the, the Eved. It might even work against the wishes of the Eved to emancipate that person because the transaction is ultimately effectuated by the master accepting. So it's not like a clean conversation of just who decides what the schut is, but it's still in there, right? Meaning it's still the question of whether it's an objective schut or if it is has to be a subjective schut is still there. So what I hope we've seen is something that, um, you know, a, a concept that is as pervasive as, you know, trying to... Um, effectuate a status change on someone's behalf to as, you know, daily conversations of trying to accept a matana on somebody's behalf. And we didn't even talk about like trying to do a mitzvah on somebody ha somebody's behalf, like a pity on her bed on somebody's behalf, for example, right? The conversation of zach and la'adam shalom of sort of what's at the heart of the conversation is both what can somebody else do for you? Because are they considered connected to you? And really at the heart of the heart is how much do we care about what you think, right? Do we need you to make someone your shaliach in order to have something happen? Do we need you to think that something is a zechut in order for it to be considered a zechut? Or can we legally define things in a way that moves beyond the sort of idiosyncratic, um, subjective way of looking at things? So thanks everybody for joining me and it is always a pleasure. Um, I wish everybody a, um, I'm going to say a meaningful Purim this year. And I actually want to end by saying, I think it's a very difficult year um, for Purim. And I just want to suggest uh, four quick themes that might be useful for people to think about this Purim as they're uh, dealing with everything. I would say, one really important theme, I think, is uh, 
Uh, the first is Tani Dester. I'm just thinking about the fact that uh, Tani often uh, this year in Tani Dester, it doesn't feel like we are acting out the moment where Esther or the Jewish people do not know how the story will end. Um, but we really know the ending. I think this year we really, really don't know the ending. And I think we should have that in mind um, in this Tanit. The war. I think um, there is a lot in Megillah Esther about war and the feeling of betrayal from uh, of Jews by their neighbors, uh, an ability to win against all odds, and a discussion about the importance of morality, of not taking the spoils in war. Mm -hmm. Um, which is in the Megillah. The third, I would say, the social mitzvot of Purim, the Mishloch Manot and Matanot Levionim, which really reminds me of the Rambam's warning that in general, the difference between Simchat Mitzvah and Simchat Kreso, the difference between the joy of a mitzvah and the joy of your stomach is the question of uh, who are you taking care of with the food that you're eating? And I hope that uh, people gain a lot of meaning out of trying to provide for others, this perm. And I would say the last is uh, something that I don't usually think much about, which is the Gemara's conversation about getting drunk enough on Purim, until we don't know the difference between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordechai. And I would say that many of us feel that we are living in a very topsy-turvy world where Haman is getting praise and Mordechai is getting curses heaped upon him. And uh, it's really important to be able to think clearly in such a world. Wishing everybody a meaningful, uh, meaningful prayer.